are our fastest growing organism on Earth, hooked up with the maker movement. Uh, well, it turns out, as we've heard from Professor Kim, the maker movement is an enormous invitation to participate, to express, and to create something we don't normally associate with cities. But this is really what the maker movement is. And this concept of the maker city really came about a few years ago. There are two meanings to it. If you accept the fact that this is a time of rapid economic and technological development where we have to prepare for the future, a maker city is a city full of makers, a city full of people who are preparing for the future, learning new skills, learning economic development. That's really a maker city. But the other meaning is it's a city full of makers who help co-create and build the city and solve city problems. That's a maker city. Now, when you bring these two together, that's very empowering. We first explored this in the United States when President Obama started convening makers and had several White House maker fairs. After all, the president said, the United States did not become strong by buying stuff, we became strong by making stuff. And the president was interested in the fact that making led to education, it led to the skills of the fourth industrial revolution, and it led to a form of democracy. We invited American cities to be maker cities, and over a hundred signed up. And then we had to figure out, what did that mean? And as we started working with them, it turned out extraordinary things were going on in the future of education, in citizens solving city problems, in bringing communities together. And we wrote a book about it. That book is called The Maker City. It came out in the United States two years ago, and last year in Korea. And it's been very exciting to see how, as this has taken off here, people who are working on building smart cities, who are building education, start uniting and collaborating and working on all of this. What is it about this maker ethos that's so powerful in cities? Well, first of all, the maker ethos is about sharing, about collaboration, about open source, which is different than how we did the 20th century. It's always learning and curious. Now that's important because we're living in a world where you don't just get educated once, you have to constantly learn and adapt. That's a new way of looking at things. Making is a rehearsal for that. And we're really adapting from software this concept of prototyping, iterating, and learning. And that's not generally how people go about building cities. So at its highest level, what a maker city does is it prepares us for the future. That's the relationship between the city and its people. Now, I have a personal story to tell here. When I got out of college, I was all excited about government. I went down to Washington, D.C., and I discovered that being part of that, that was a little bit like playing a video game, where no matter what you did with the controller, it didn't affect the screen. Now, for those of you who are gamers, you know that's a bad user experience if you get bored and leave. And if you look at politically today, a lot of people are getting bored and leaving, and that's leading to a lack of faith in government. So if actually you can be directly involved and solve problems, that's good for everybody. And that's true in government. This starts even with the notion of open data in a city. If you have data and you can act on it, you can make a change. One example comes from Japan. During the Fukushima disaster, the government couldn't or wouldn't tell the citizens where the radiation was. That upset a lot of moms in Japan who wanted to protect their families. They partnered with MIT that built an open source radiation detector that hooked into iPhones, and the moms found the radiation. They got turned into makers and held the government accountable. In San Francisco and Oakland, we opened our data, and suddenly citizens started holding the police accountable. They noticed, for example, that the crime of prostitution was committed once a month from north to south on San Pablo Avenue. And the citizens said, surely a crime isn't committed that way. That's lazy policing. Um, this led to the use of maker spaces and hack spaces to start solving civic problems, makers and cities coming together. I'll tell you one story. I run such an organization in San Francisco called Gray Area Foundation for the Arts. We happen to be located in the middle of where all the crime is. We mapped all the crime and put that onto an exhibit, and I thought, we're going to get in trouble because we're showing all of this. But the fact that we gathered this and shared this suddenly led the community working together. The police came in and said, people are paying attention. I made that arrest. Single moms came in and said, thank you for pointing out the problem here. By opening the stuff up and collaborating, open source led to better government. 
we had some fun. That part of town was very noisy. And, uh, and, and it turns out that uh, nobody found out where all the noise was. So we put out sensors. We actually built sensors and we put all over town to capture the noise. We fed that data back to the government. And because we made all these sensors and deployed them without permission, we were able to hold the government accountable. So that's an example of how this can help the government. But it also turns out that making is an act of resilience. And at a time of climate change and change in our world, you actually want all citizens to be able to help, and the maker community can. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, in 2012, we had a very bad hurricane in New York called Hurricane Sandy. It knocked out a lot of the gasoline stations. Nobody could get gas. And the federal government couldn't even figure out which gas stations were open. And I was working with a friend at the White House, and he basically said, we can't find the gas stations. And I said, well, maybe you could use data that comes from individuals. So we called up Waze. If you know Waze, Google bought it, which is a mapping program. So we sent a letter off to the White House and basically said, um, we sent a letter from the White House to Waze, we're looking for the data, can you find it? And in just a few hours, they changed their program, and citizens all over the place started contributing where the gas stations were open. And to this day, Waze now works with citizens to find data. But here's something even more interesting. Once they had that data, how did it get disseminated? There was a high school in New Jersey. It was actually a pretty poor high school, good high school, but poor students. They were, they were not economically fortunate. Their teacher taught them about mapping. For years, they've been learning about mapping in STEM. Suddenly, there was this disaster. They found all the gas stations. They found them better than the government or the newspaper. These kids were beaming. The, they're actually texting out to the newspapers. They say to the Wall Street Journal, your data is inaccurate, we have it. They tell the city of New York, we, the high school students using the software, we found the gas stations. The United States Department of Energy realized that these high school students, these makers, knew where the open gas stations were, and they tweeted out to them, you're doing a great job. They basically said to the kids' moms, please don't let them go to sleep this early. We need their help in finding all of this. Finally, the government thanked them a lot. And this pointed out that by teaching students this act of uh, resilience, they learned something. They were actually able to become a workforce to help the government. Making is also a sandbox for the future of manufacturing. By sandbox, we mean an experimental place, a place where you learn. And, uh, and, and you've heard from Professor Kin about all the richness in a maker space that teaches you about the future of manufacturing. In Louisville, in Kentucky, General Electric has a plant that builds appliances. And in there is a giant maker space. Why? They're inviting the, compute, the community in to build the future of appliances. It costs $40 million for GE to make an appliance, but when people sit around and hack and make things and put them on Kickstarter, the research is free, and if there's a hit, both GE and the makers succeed. Here's so when we say hack the home, we really need it. Our hope is that you might take an oven or a refrigerator or a microwave, go ahead and break it, because we know you're going to come out with something cool from that. You didn't need a clue. All tachathons come from a software perspective. I work on my computer, we work on our machine, and you can really do that about anywhere. What we've done here with this facility is we've tied in mechanical engineers, we've tied in designers. This is a big open collaboration. I think the next set of American manufacturing is going to be more niche, diverse. It's not, I'm an electrical engineer, I'm a software engineer, I'm a maker. This is further proof that the maker movement is blown up. In 10 years, you're going to look back and be like, I can't believe we did all that stuff. So here's a giant corporation, opens a maker space, invites in the community, and uh, and, and students, and they start coming up with things. What did they come up with? Well, they came up with a, uh, a, a cooktop that is an induction cooker and is so smart, it reads the data on what's being cooked and does a good job. An ice maker that makes that delicious crunchy ice that you get in a restaurant, the number one new electronic product in Amazon. And a cold press coffee machine, which they actually created this and it failed on Kickstarter. So you'd think that's a failure, but they learned that they couldn't raise their money really early on. So these young entrepreneurs didn't waste money. They did it in the enclave of this place. They failed quickly, which is what you're supposed to do. That worked out well. Ford Motor Company has a maker space in its headquarters. They've turned thousands of employees into inventors. Why? Well, most people don't get to make a car. They might be in accounting or marketing. 
when they did this, they suddenly leapt ahead. They became the number one car company with new patents in the world. By the way, this also prepared their workers for the future at a time of rapid change, aging workers learning new skills. When we talk about a maker city, making and manufacturing is gonna be different in the city. Here's the Tesla plant um, in Fremont, California. That plant has been built next to apartment buildings and mass transit. Because you see, it's a much cleaner plant. It's not dirty like old plants. When Tesla built this, they couldn't even find an urban planner that could build an auto plant next to housing because it hadn't been done in 100 years. But what they basically learned is that's the future of manufacturing inside of the city. Hi, I'm Nick Pinkston. I'm the founder of Plethora. Essentially, we're building a new kind of factory that makes this you can go from a design to a part um, very quickly. So like, we're talking same day manufacturing here. We actually have to be as close to our customers as possible because our customers want speed more than anything else. So essentially, we are blocks for many of our customers. So they can just walk over here and pick up their parts. If they're waiting weeks for things to come overseas or come from other shops, they're behind. So you're having suppliers from the very high end, you know, multinational companies are coming back and wouldn't be in market, all the way down to like guys in the garage working on something. Like this entire thing from components and short run production and prototypers and mass manufacturers, all of this is now coming back to cities because we have to be more reactive. You know, we have to actually build things here because we have to innovate directly in market to do it. So what's going on here? The hardware world is learning from software. When you build software, if there's a problem, you fix it the next day, it's a service. His customers are people like Facebook, Oculus, and Tesla. If there's an idea or a change in a product line, they need the product there next, the next day. So manufacturing suddenly has to respond as quickly as software and be downtown next to everybody else. That's why makers are important and why this ethos fits in there. Okay, it also turns out that these new techniques can transform construction in the built world. That's important because our cities are growing very quickly. Uh, 3,000 new buildings a day going on. And we're going to apply 3D printing and construction techniques and reduce cost to the future. For example, you might have makers design and 3D print a bridge. If the machines are going to take our jobs, we might as well do it with the style. MX3D, a research and development startup specializing in robotic 3D print technology, is hoping to construct a bridge over a canal in Amsterdam sometime this September using only two robots. They'd start on either bank and work their way toward each other in the middle, ejecting molten steel as they go, crafting their beams from multiple angles instead of on a more typical horizontal plane. The molten metal can be shaped by the printer to produce straight lines, spirals, really any shape the engineers have in mind. Don't think the MX3D team has missed out on the symbolism either. They note their choice to construct a bridge is a beautiful metaphor to connect the technology of the future with the old city, bringing out the best of both worlds. This is what that looks like. This is a bridge in Amsterdam. Uh, it was designed with machine learning and there's sensors all over it, so the bridge continues to learn from its audience so it can become smarter and help build the next bridge. Um, I'm going to skip ahead of a couple of these to talk about how we can apply robotics to actually the built environment and housing as a way of reducing cost and letting us live in smaller apartments. Uh, all of this is to say that there's a manufacturing revolution that's going on and we can push this all the way off to kids learning in schools as they pick it up and then bring it into the real world. That's why I say a maker city prepares us for the future. And uh, uh, that's important because of the future of employment. And we can see this in a number of places, and this is where education and making comes in. Let's take a look at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where they pulled this all the way down to primary school, and it's made enormous changes. The Dream Factory is a combination of three classes that were previously separated. The art room, the tech ed room, and computers. All three teachers collaborate and bring together art and engineering. When it's hands-on learning, it's something that you want to do. We need to measure. And you have four to go over your board. We get asked to our traditional wood shop, metal shop. Students are programming interactive games, building robots. Do they want to do 3D printing? Do they want to do painting? Do they want to do sculpture? This is not a gifted program. It's not an after-school activity. Every kid is getting this in our school. They brought together three 20th century disciplines, shop, art, and the 21st century one, computer science. They combined it, called it something new, and that's where a lot of education goes on. And also, it teaches collaboration and community, a very important soft skill to learn. 
On the right, there's Stinky, drawn by a second grader. And the eighth graders have to figure out how you take that 2D diagram and make something physical and 3D out of it. That's the power of making. All of this leads to a global movement that puts the accent on cities and the accent on the possibility of how maker cities are being interpreted locally, worldwide. And there's been a flurry of writing about this. My friend Jim Fallows looked at a, took a 100,000 mile journey across America. Bruce Katz writes about how to finance all this. And Tomas Dietz out of Barcelona takes an amazing take on global maker cities that can be used for resilience with a number of factors that are inclusive, ecological, bring us into a resilient future. This starts in cities, and it starts with a movement like this. Let me wrap up and talk about civic capacity. Who are the institutions that are gonna make all of this happen? Now that we have maker spaces, how does this become a big deal throughout Korea? Uh, just yesterday I was meeting uh, with Jung Se Kun, who was the former speaker of the assembly here, and is doing a documentary on how all of this happens. One of our experiences in the United States is to get other institutions involved in this, like newspapers. Normally a newspaper reports on what's going on. We're taking a number of them and making them actually protagonists to bring about change. For example, we're working with the Kansas City Star in our industrial Midwest. All across America, the most interesting examples of redevelopment and economic growth come bubbling up from our cities and from towns as downtowns come back, as the new skills of open innovation take place. Kansas City may be one of the best examples in America. To get a sense for Kansas City's revitalization and resurgence, I'm talking to Tony Burke, who is the publisher of the Kansas City Star. Tony, give me a sense for kind of how the city has been uh, evolving in the last few years. The city has been really getting stronger in its entrepreneurial space. And I think we see a lot of businesses popping up. I think we see a lot of people moving from the east and west coast into the Midwest um, for the opportunity to be in the Silicon Valley and the Prairie and really have a chance to expand their operations. There's a real strong entrepreneurial spirit growing in Kansas City right now. You know, the Star is actually going through a revitalization right now. We'll be moving locations here in the next probably 30 days, moving into uh, our beautiful Press Pavilion building, which is really what started the revitalization. This is a really important project. You know, this is something our CEO, Craig Foreman, came up with last year, um, partners us up with the Maker City Movement and you, and really sat down and started to think about how can we take a more expanded role in that? How can we be an amplification vehicle for um, what the future of work and industry in Kansas City is going to look like? As we embarked on that project, we brought a group of makers from Kansas City in and really sat down with them and spent two days really discussing what are the things that the star can do to really help that. And out of that came really, I think, four strong initiatives. You're going to see a very strong maker platform that really is more of a meet the maker kind of um, look and feel to it. It's going to be 360 degree video views of every makerspace in Kansas City. It's going to be behind the scenes stories about makers that are in Kansas City. It's going to be weekly features in the paper that are going to really draw attention to these people and, the, and not only what they're doing, but the impact they're having in Kansas City. And then I think you're going to see some of that civic work when you look at utilizing sensors around Kansas City to figure out what is being impacted. What is the air impact? What is the noise impact? What are the things that are going on around Kansas City that may be impacting the environment? And I think you really are going to see from us a strong push into art installation, some things that we can do in town that allow us to make this a better community to live in. What I've found over the last year is that we have an audience out there that we're not reaching. We have an audience that we can really bring attention to, and it's an audience that's growing every day. I mean, it's not easy being a journalist today. I think we have people every day that go out with that passion and that desire to be great watchdogs for this community, as well as to be great ambassadors for what Kansas City is. And I think a lot like jazz, we see a, a very strong connection in this movement that our business has got a lot of different pieces that need to be pulled together right now. And this is just one more way for us to be not only important, but impactful in our communities. So this is a way of connecting up a civic institution and moving all of this stuff forward. Um, I'll finally end up with this. You know, makers just have this sense that they can go accomplish anything. We, this is a word called agency in social sciences. So you just believe you can get something done. Here's an example of that. Uh, I have a friend, Jason, who lived in Texas. And where he lived in the suburbs, they did not have uh, a, a, a train. They did not have uh, a transit. And he wanted that, so he said to the government, how come we don't have that? And they said, you live in the suburbs of the United States, you don't get that. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, I want to have that. And they said, please be quiet, we don't do this in America. Um, 
Well, it turns out the government's grant fell through, but he organized a whole bunch of makers and created the Oak Cliff Transit Authority. He just said, I'm the authority, and the government said, no, you're not. But because they came together, he got himself funded. I got so excited about that, I created the San Francisco Prototyping Authority. And I made everybody a commissioner. I said, we should go solve problems. But here's the thing. We actually went ahead and did that. When the city wanted to redesign downtown, they turned to a group of makers, and we took 50 parts of downtown, a couple hundred makers, and we changed the city planning laws, letting them come up with structures that would live temporarily so the city could learn from them. We called it the Urban Prototyping Festival. Here you see them working with machines at Autodesk, and I'm going to show you a quick clip of what that looked like. One of the makers even wrote a song about prototyping. <laughs> And one more time. There's a little something no one's talking about. It's a learning tool to work things out. One to one, or one to three. Get hands on, come along. Be lady. It's better than off and cheap out of sight. people come out and socialize, and as San Francisco's Civic Spine, if we can't erase barriers that are dividing us right now in a space like Market Street, we're going to have a lot of trouble solving a lot of other issues in the city, and so we have to start with the public spaces and creating spaces of connection and of empathy, and from there, I think we have the energy and the positive thoughts of how to address the deeper divisions that are challenging the city today. So I hope I've left you with the notion that the Maker City is an invitation. In the maker movement, you can't help but solve problems and build things. And the one thing the world doesn't have a lack of today is problems, and engaging everyone in solving that, solving civic problems together as an act of government democracy, preparing people for the future economically and learning the new skills and learning how to do that for lifelong, that's a great economic act. Uh, and then there's the educational side of this. When this comes together, our cities really are maker cities preparing us for tomorrow. And that's the work that we're up to at the Maker City Organization. Thank you.